Born in 1924 in Mozambique, Bertina Lopez was one of the few African women artists not ignored by male art critics. Her artwork was heavily influenced by her personal and political feelings about colonialists and the people they oppressed. Lopez's involvement with anti-fascist movements in Africa and Portugal in the 1950s and 60s exiled her from both countries in totems Created in response to the African Civil Wars of the 1970s, she combined scraps of wood and rope, which she viewed as symbols of African culture. Lopez's work shifted when she moved to Rome in 1964. Astral planes and planetary orbits suddenly appeared in her work, but these pieces also included signs, symbols, and geometric shapes that displayed her love of Africa. Born in 1943, Judith Scott was an American fiber sculptor. She crafted armatures from discarded materials and then wrapped these forms with cloth, yarn, thread, cord, wire, and paper towels. Really anything she could wrap would be added into her work. Scott was born with Down syndrome and lost her hearing due to scarlet fever. At age seven, Judith Scott was sent away to an institution where she remained for 35 years until her twin sister, Joyce, became her guardian. Judith moved into Joyce's home and in 1987 enrolled at the Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland, California. Here, she discovered she had an amazing talent for sculpture. During the next 18 years, Scott created more than 200 breathtaking multimedia sculptures that reflected her unique and complex vision. Chen Yanyin is a 61-year-old Chinese sculptor who works and lives in Shanghai. Her career in art began at 19 when she was assigned by the state to study jade carving at the Shanghai School of Arts and Crafts. Chen's first job after art school was at the Shanghai Mint, creating designs for presentational coins. As she grew as an artist, Chen realized her true artistic voice was in sculpture. Her work shifted, and as her talent bloomed, her pieces began to reflect a combination of her personal history and China's national history. As you can see with this piece titled 1949, The Young Pioneers of Communist China, this sculpture, part of her mother series, deals with Chen's mother, who, because of her bourgeoisie background, was never allowed to join young pioneers. Chen Yangying continues to create prize-winning sculptures and installations for commissions and public spaces. Fujiko Nakia was born in Sapporo, Japan in 1933. Nokia has been transforming public spaces for nearly 50 years. Nokia first gained attention for fog sculpture when she joined the American Art Collective, Experiments in Art and Technology, EAT, which embraced collaborations between artists and engineers. Her inventive use of fog as a sculptural medium combines Nokia's talents as a painter with her lifelong passion for immersive natural phenomena. Fujiko Nakia's inventive fog environments engulf participants and then subside, taking away and then revealing the world around them, like a death followed by a rebirth. Born in 1652 in Seville, Luisa Inacia Roldan, also known as La Rodana, began her career as an artist in her late twenties in the city of Cadiz. There she carved towering wooden statues and sculptures for the local cathedral. After two years, La Rodana moved to Madrid, where she was appointed court sculptor for two different kings. A prolific artist, she was well known for her mystical large wooden statues of saintly and secular figures. La Rodana also carved small terracotta figures, which she sold all over Spain. Despite the support of church and state, La Rodana and her children lived in hunger and poverty. She died a pauper in Madrid in 1706. 
Born in 1844 in upstate New York, Edmonia Mary Lewis was the first professional female Native American and African American sculptor. Given the name of Wildfire at birth, she was orphaned at the age of nine and spent four years with two maternal Chippewa aunts traveling around New York and selling crafts. In 1859, Wildfire enrolled in Oberlin College, where she renamed herself Edmonia Mary Lewis. At Oberlin, Lewis was falsely accused of a crime, and although acquitted, she was bullied and badly beaten and then denied re-enrollment. Devastated, she moved moved on to Boston. There she created bronze sculptures of abolitionists and Civil War heroes. Copies of these works financed her move to Italy, where she worked for most of her career. Her whereabouts later in life remains a mystery. Mira Mukherjee was born in 1928 in Kolkata, India. During her early life, her artistic studies took Mukherjee to Delhi and Germany and later to Bustad, where she learned the ancient Bengali method of lost wax casting. She modernized this ancient casting method by adding strips and rolls of metal to her bronze sculptures. Mukherjee did not believe in art for art's sake, and her attempts to improve social conditions went far beyond her own socially conscious artwork. She secured an education and employment for hundreds of craftspeople and taught young girls a pictorial stitching craft for quilt making called Kanta. In 1992, she was awarded the Padma Shri for her incredible contributions to India's art and culture. Mira Mukherjee died in 1998 at the age of 75. Shana Orlov was born in a small village in Ukraine on July 12, 1888. She and her family immigrated to Palestine in 1905, where she worked as a seamstress. Her sewing talent led her to Paris to study cutting and dressmaking. By 1912, Orlov's career took a turn, and she began studying sculpture at the Académie Russe. Within a year, she was invited to exhibit two wood busts at the Grand Palais. She worked in wood, cement, terracotta, bronze, and stone. Left alone to raise her child after her husband's death in 1918, she became the portraitist of the Parisian elite. Between 1940 and 1942, Orloff lived in occupied Paris. Under constant danger, she and her son escaped into Switzerland, where they remained until the end of the war. The most famous early image of a human is a woman. Her name is Woman of Willendorf. For nearly a century, men have claimed this sculpture was a fertility figure, a good luck totem, a mother goddess symbol, or an aphrodisiac made by men for the appreciation of men. But recently, scholars Catherine McCoy and Leroy McDermott have argued that the woman of Willendorf was actually created by a woman. What has been seen as evidence of obesity or adiposity is actually the foreshortening effect of self-inspection. She is likely a self-portrait. The woman of Willendorf is one of the oldest and most complete surviving artifacts from the Paleolithic period. 